Hello, welcome back to the Cube's coverage here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. IBM Think is happening. We are here at the Pop Up Cube. Holger Mollis here is Cube alumni, con Cube contributor, also research principal research as a constellation and a friend of the Cube. Holger, great to see you. Um, you finally made it back on the Cube. Yeah, I can't believe it, huh? You gave me 18 minutes notice. Huh? Am I the fastest visitor on the Cube? The fastest no, guest on the Cube? You yeah. texted me before. I tried to get you on last time, but I couldn't yeah, yeah, make I it know, work. Know, you, know. You're flying out yeah. of uh, Google Next. Yep. Um, but a lot going on. Uh, I really appreciate your perspective. You were also recently at a variety of other events. Oracle had an analyst event, Google Next. The industry right now is going through a major platform reshift. Yes. When I say reshift, it's shifted, it's reshifting again. The, the tectonic plates are moving um, with generative AI at all layers of the stack. Yes. IBM's here, we had Dell has their event. What's your take on this? What are you seeing? Are you seeing the, the, the line forming between the old way and new way? Could you share your view? Yeah, I think um, we saw this rebalancing that on-premises was something which was getting alive again, right? I wrote about this uh, six, seven years ago. I called the infinite compute platform where you can move workloads seamlessly from the public cloud to on-premises. It has worked really well for some vendors. We had IBM, like OpenShift from Red Hat, allows you to run across multiple public clouds and on-premises even to the edge. That's exactly that. Enters with a boom, Gen AI, and all of a sudden it's all about elasticity again even can't get uh, NVIDIA machines for your on-premises workloads, right? So the, the, the balance is always tipping back and forward. It's totally moving in towards the public cloud right now. And that sounds like super cloud definition as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah sorry. Charles Fitzgerald would love to have a debate. Infinite cloud, what's it, what do you call it? Infinite computing platform. Infinite computing platform. So yep. we have the super cloud, but it all points to the same thing. A new way to operate, which everybody wants, which is a first, party choice by the company but to run their cloud operations, their infrastructure, their way, not the vendor's way. This has been a big uh, multi-cloud problem mm -hmm. that you got three clouds, they all have different sets of the same services. You still need identity management, yes. but it's different on all three. You need data, but it's in all three clouds. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you handle portability? All these things now are coming to the surface. That's correct. Now that we have generative AI, the forcing function, what do you see happening right now? Obviously, do you see the Gen AI market stalled a little bit on the app side? Um, is the action in the infrastructure? Are they retooling there? And, and then what happens next after the infrastructure gets kind of like tooled up quickly? The middle layer can really get innovative. What's your, your, right. so, your so analysis? Great question, right? But what Gen AI does is basically collapses everything again. In my view, bigger is better when it comes to Gen AI. If I know that the weather just changed from cloudy this morning in Boston to sun. I'm going to put on more ice cream in my freezers because I know people will eat ice cream, which otherwise they wouldn't. So bigger models have more awareness, are more human, will be better in business. And bigger models need more data. So data gravity, which we've been talking about for a long time, is getting really, really, again, tangible. And that means it's going to move to certain clouds. You're absolutely right what you said before, the multi-cloud capabilities, that made vendors across the whole stack. We can go back to 10 years ago, Cloud Foundry for Pass, we had IBM, right? We can talk HashiCorp for DevOps. We can go to MongoDB. We set lots of events recently there. Their user summit, um, cross clouds. Companies want to be cross cloud, but if I want to do AI and have to do a large language model, I need to get the data together. And, and that's why the surge in on premise. So the term AI factory that Jensen Wong, at CEO of NVIDIA, has been talking about, yeah. he's promoting that because he wants to reinvent the, the idea that you can create a data center on premise, whether it's on a premise or in a, in a colo facility, but you can build a purpose-built set of infrastructure yes. to service a workload. Yes. Do, are, do you buy that? No. <laughs> okay, good. Because Why? Jen, Jensen was in this business, right? Five years ago, the key question of NVIDIA was, can NVIDIA survive because none of the cloud vendors is using their GPUs? None of them was five years ago, right? And only Microsoft's fumble of building their own custom silicon Right, Kevin Scott found OpenAI, and OpenAI, good done from Jensen, got their first DGX machine in 2016. I don't know if you've seen the, the tweets on the cube of Elon Musk yeah. being at OpenAI at the time and the first yeah. DGX machine coming there. Great seeding. There's the dependency of OpenAI on NVIDIA has made NVIDIA, again, a cloud company, the most valuable company in the world. So Jensen is talking about something which was very popular out of necessity because nobody is doing this stuff. Right now, he can only sell to cloud vendors because they pay a premium. Yeah. Right? So very interesting at Oracle's OCI Summit two weeks ago, um, they prepay in cash they shared, right, to get infrastructure being built. 
right? Suppliers are being paid in cash so they can roll out their data centers across the whole stack. We're not talking about NVIDIA, but basically today, you know, you can only get the NVIDIA machine if you're a friend of Jensen and Colin. And so is that, a, is that because they want to bogart the machines and get it, hoard them in and store them? Or, or is it just pointing to the use case that the large language models and the large cloud players have a use case called consumer business? Amazon's got retail, Meta has Facebook, I mean, Google's got search and then they have clouds behind it. So you have all these super clouds, these big cloud, hyper clouds have retail businesses. That's a consumer version of AI. Would you, would you see that? What's your reaction to that? There, there is a bigger need on the consumer side and the large part is fueled by the advertising wars, right? If you, people don't want Google something anymore, they ask generative AI and want a summary, which then has advertising links in them, right? That's going to happen. You will see that. And you just saw Google at Google I.O. last week announcing that more yeah. and more of the questions you Google will be generative AI answer. That needs massive compute. But the, the awareness of what's happening in the real world is not only relevant for consumers yeah. to sell advertising, that's relevant for everything. At what temperature do you want to run this hotel lobby that we're in? Right? What loudness do we want to put on, on our microphone reception here? Right? Yeah. The understanding of the real world with multimodal models, which is the big innovation of 2024, that models can understand more things, is the key aspect. And this is why we're larger is better. If I don't have my weather, my noise information together, I yeah. cannot build the eye for it. Dave Vellante put a um, poll on his Twitter about who's going to open up the AI. Uh, clearly, 73% of respondents, mostly analysts, agreed that uh, the hyperscalers will mop up the AI business and ultimately probably give language models away for free. Because, um, yep. Your thoughts on that? And but, does that validate what you're just saying is um, that the, the service providers for AI will be the monster cloud players? Yeah, there, there's no way around it because we know that the pushback to public cloud from the early days was if I know my workload, if I can predictive and it's stable, then I go to public cloud, right? Quick, quick side, a comment on the side, right? Largest, one of the largest, most valuable companies in the world, Apple didn't build a cloud, uses the clouds for backup, which is super stable, right? You can't take so many pictures to make this a volatile part, but even then it's being used. So the problem is generative AI workloads and need of an enterprise cannot be assessed by any a CIO, CTO today. You cannot go to your board and say, I need 10 million to buy 20 DGX machines and we'll be fine for the next five years. There is no way of knowing that. And that uncertainty comes back to, if you boil everything down, systems more quality, what is the key quality of the cloud? It's elasticity. Elasticity from a technical perspective, ramp up and down, and more importantly, from a commercial perspective, you yeah. use more, you pay more, you use less, you pay less. So that's uh, why the cloud wins. All right, so let's take that cloud benefit and then try to map that onto the AI world. So mm -hmm. elasticity, that's a technical yeah. and more agility, that's a, a me mechanism-based value proposition. Like the um, the, the uh, cost side is pay, what you pay by the drink. Right. That's economics. Yep. So they had both the economic value proposition as well as the technical, I'm oversimplifying mm -hmm. it, but agility, that's why startups went there first. Go to the prison and data center, we all know that rule. Okay, fast forward to the AI world now. What are the problems that, that people have? But, I don't have the hardware to load, run my own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the expertise to run AI. And how the hell does this impact my business, both cost efficiency and maybe new revenue? But, so, no, okay, it, what's their answer? And they the, go where? This, this is why you need to move to the cloud because apart from machines only are saying, there. You're saying that's the reason to move to the cloud? Yes. People okay. who are not in the cloud need to move in the cloud. I need to move my data closer to right now the DGX machines, maybe in two, three years, hopefully there's more competition to the Intel, AMD, whatever machines uh, to create the generative AI that I need to run and power my enterprise. Got okay, let me ask you another question. So. I buy that, by the way. I think that's that's a good, yeah. good, good, good what, outlook. What, we agree on something? Yeah, we agree. <laughs> I like that we're going to debate this. Yeah. Okay, here's the next thing. You said end-to-end -end workload. If yes. you know your workload, you go to the cloud. A lot of companies have workloads that are well-defined. They have a back-end, a software model, and a front-end application. It could be a banking app or whatever. Yes. Yes. It's well understood. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, it can scope that workload end-to-end. -end. Right. Now, by adding generative AI into the equation, they say, great, I know my workload end-to-end, -end, I, I can now build purpose-built hardware and or workload to support the workloads, whether that's for response time or reasoning. So question, you optimize infrastructure for the, the, the IO of generating question answer, whether that's a prompt under the covers or directly, that's going to be low, low latency response right. or go away and think of a problem, reason. There's use cases to use different, maybe potentially clouds. Will you go to a cloud on that and or would you build it on-premise if the data is proprietary? 
Fine. Well, first of all, data proprietary is important, no question. We live in a knowledge economy, data is the most important asset. But I think there's no concern to if your data is on premises, is safer than it's in the public cloud, bearing any potential accidents. I think we're past that decade in that discussion. The, the key things though is, do you want to, do you believe in larger being better? I'm a strong believer in that camp. If you only want to do classic IT and says, I have my banking application and I'm going to do some intelligence, right? There's some people out there saying, oh, AI is just intelligence analytics. I think it's much, much more because it goes to insight to action, to the automation of transaction, to the automation of bots, to the automation of agents. But if you do small AI, you can do that on premise and try to figure that out. But I think the small AI will always lose against the big AI and the big AI needs cloud. And here comes the key thing. Even so, I know my transaction application really well, it's predictable, like I'm more cost efficient on premises. I need the data of that in the public cloud to run my AI models on that. Right? If I see fraud, a classic example, right? I had 120 data scientists working my team at FICO 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm right, 15, 20 years ago, yeah. right? Trying to figure out fraud. We had to get tapes from the banks. It took us half a year. Yeah. We were so much behind the fraud. Today, you have to be faster. Your transaction systems yeah. on premise, you once a day dump it in the cloud to figure out fraud, you could have lost millions. It's like a video game. If you're lagging, you're gonna lose every time. You're gonna get shot on the, on the first person shooter games. That's, happens all the time. But the, no, but the, but the so, lag, you bring up a good point. You can't, data quality and data low late, latency addressability. Is it in the right place at the right time? So mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question. Yep. What, define big AI, because you said that a few times. When you say you need the cloud for your big AI. Right. Define what's the difference between big AI and small AI. Right. So, so big AI is when you take all the data available in your enterprise and from third parties to build your models on that, which by definition are very large language models, right? They're very similar to OpenAI's Bake the Internet, to Gemini 1.5, Bake the Internet, to Llama, Bake the Internet, and so on. Maybe not as big, but very, very large. Versus you do on-premise, on-device potentially, AI, but there's use cases for that too, but it only uses that local data. And the question is if the small AI can make the right decisions. Yep. That's awesome. So, okay, let's get back into the power law. Mm -hmm. So you start to see specialized models. Enterprises are, you can, you can see the IQ of the enterprises, almost a right. shadow IT model, yep. shadow AI. A lot of RAG, a lot of retrieval, augmentation generation, mm -hmm. they even came up in today's keynote at IBM yep. on the partner summit mm -hmm. here. It's an easy thing to do. If you have data, do some rag on it. It's small AI. It's not a large AI model to your definition. Yes. So there's a lot of that going on. Is that an indicator of appetite or people tire kicking? No, it's uh, the, the art of the possible right now. And the possible is always limited by the vendor doing that, right? If you look at the vendors who have large managed models, Microsoft, uh, Meta, Google, they give you the architecture and what really matters is the foundation model architecture. How are you going to do that layer cake from your very large, boil the ocean, have the whole internet language model to the one which might give you an industry aspect, might give you a vendor aspect, might give you your customer data and your, your customer specific stuff to be private and be, be, be safe from anybody else looking into that. But that's a layer cake. So I don't see enough discussion about foundation model architectures, which is a big thing. And by the way, IBM was one of the first winners as we hear to talk about foundation model architecture last year and summer, which should give them a lead on this and it'll be interesting to see what so, they talk about here. Yeah, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. Let's, yeah. let's, let's unpack that nuance of foundation model architecture. Yeah. Are you referring to that from a data perspective? Or are you referring from, a, from an architecture, from an infrastructure standpoint? Because Arch if you think about the horizontal scalability needs, yes. as well as the data model to match that, yes. are they hand in glove or what do you, how do you see that, those two distinctions? I talk about it from an AI model architecture. Right, which uh, means that you you have a you have a cake layered cake, right? Like at weddings, mm -hmm. where there's different layers, and how can you go very quickly across them? Infrastructure there is again, it has to be in one place. You can theoretically we'll have the same discussion like back in the data days. Put all your data in the lake or federate the data, right? We know the federation guys have lost because you can't get the levels of service. AI has to be fast and efficient, right? If you have to wait, latency with an expensive NVIDIA GPU right now for your data to be rag augmented from your on-premise data center where you're closing the books right now and it's super slow. Yeah. You're paying through the roof. That's not affordable. So you need to create the lake house, which finally everybody has agreed on, in the public cloud, in the right place where there's cheap custom silicon on custom hardware. So talk about the data lake, you mentioned that in the Federated. It's a great yeah. example of why centralized is actually good, an argument for centralization. Yes. Totally agree with you on this. Yes. Now let's take it to the next level. What's next behind Snowflake and Databricks? Because they have the data cloud 1.0, 
That's my words, and they would not agree with <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's a 2.0 world coming around. I mentioned a few scenarios. So, right. for example, I'm going to have this big, maybe this data lake, and I want to turn it into a high-velocity series of rivers mm -hmm. to feed mm -hmm. my devices or other subsystems. Yeah. Neural net, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call it. Yep. But how do you get at an edge device or some other location the data in less than an, in a millisecond or a nanosecond to an edge device? The laws of physics cannot be changed. Correct. And if data is expensive, you got a problem. Yes. You're saying that means the edge device can't generate. So we're back down to reminds me of the tactical edge conversation. Highly availability, high availability, or highly available data. There's nuance on data management. So I just. But don't... John, we have 5G now. It's all solved. So, but <laughs> it, but, so. but this has to change. There has to be a changing of the model of the egress. But you either egressing and get eliminating that completely. Which they will never happen. Yep. Right? I mean, unless you see some, or an entrepreneur come out and create new switches or new systems mm -hmm. that could handle it. Yeah. So but I think we saw some motion in the egress, largely thanks to Oracle, didn't charge much to it. There's been a reflection for Google and AWS on the egress costs. So this like California hotel model come in and you can never leave, right? Bring your data, but you can't take it out. I think that's weakening up to a certain point, and enterprise will make a big stink if that's going to be going to be the hindrance for them to create that one single place. Where, by the way, as we know in good IT, you should always have the backup place as well. Now, to, to your edge problem. The, the bigger challenge I see as a software guy on the edge is not necessarily the connectivity, it's that the edge has to do also something that's autonomous. Yeah. Your, your thermostat in your home cannot yeah. make a decision or to hold, yeah. hold cool because it lost connectivity or still waiting for the data to download, right? So it's the autonomous part and then the augmented part when there's connectivity and how much data can you push to the edge to make the edge do intelligent decisions again autonomously because it might be disconnected again. That's the interesting question. Yeah, in my and view. That, that's a constraint that needs to be yes. solved for. So yes. that can either be solved by real data or synthetic data, possibly. That's I another mean, synthetic fantastic. data yes. is emerging. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a, like a copy of data. So we're yeah. starting to get into a whole, again, the, this notion changes the game. Yeah. So the question for you is who wins and who loses? Because again, we're starting to see the line in the industry forming between the old way and new way. Yes. The fog is lifting. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see it. If you do things this way, you're going to be screwed. You better be on the right side of history. So we got to get on the right side of the street. So what what is that? What does that look like to you? If you can say, can you start to see the formation of the line between old way, new way? We're in a classic disruptive enablement market. It's it's an enablement, but it's going to disrupt something. Something will change. It's either old and you're not new, and so some, some old becomes new. They transform. What's your take on old and new? Give us your breakdown. The, the old will be anybody who is stuck in on-premises in what I call finite computing architectures, right? Where you would go and go out and size your ERP system and say, uh, how much do we need for the three peaks of ERP, right? Closing your books, running your manufacturing, and running payroll. God beware, never run those together. The system will stop for everybody, right? You have to space them out. So anybody who thinks in finite computer architectures will be in a big of problem. Anybody who also thinks small and is trying to get wins under the pocket as much as they might be. So I think in 2024, you will get lots of wins in enterprise with small models, right? If you're the yeah. CTO in charge, do some small models to keep everybody happy, but keep the prize in mind, which is large. Larger is better. And to anybody who is an infinite side, who is on the cloud side, who has elasticity architecturally, commercially, who can run algorithms who are easy to use, or easy to use by business people, right? We will yeah. see the same yeah. democratization of AI that we saw for okay. coding. So the low code, no code of AI needs to happen this year, hopefully, latest next year. Democratization of AI, those will be the winners. So just to, just to put it out there, small model and large models, they're not mutually exclusive in your mind. You can do both. You should do both, yeah, well, but you, you need to keep in mind that the large model is ultimately going to win, and the sooner you are the large model, it, it will make better decisions, better automated decisions for you. It's like a brain; it's the bigger brain, but you have other synapses in there. So, correct. I'll give you quite. I'll give you another debate here. Yeah. So, so okay, I th I think this, they're not mutually exclusive. You can you can go all in on the company models, yeah. large. Yeah. You have some central brain that you create, but right. multimodal, of course. Yep. Yeah. And then you got smaller models that will work almost like plugins. Mm -hmm. Right. It's almost Still. like connecting into right. the LLMs, yep. working together. Because there's small pockets of little proprietary things, but model integration will be the reality. Model integration is going to be key, and that's where the incompatibilities might come out of these small models, right? You have the world saying it's hot in Boston now, and the small one saying in May, I don't put ice cream in my things. Who are you yeah. going to trust? Yeah, yeah. Right? What are you going to do? So I only see small long-term, and I'm talking two, three years, succeeding when you're on a satellite on the way to Mars. 
because nothing is going to happen yeah. around you anymore. If it happens on this very planet, so many things happen, well, right? Well, the Iranian president has a helicopter accident. What yeah. does it mean for my investments for the oil price, right? Uh, How does the oil price well, affect all, my filling up, take, take an Uber, or do I take public transport to come here to speak on the queue? Well, <laughs> it's all connected, right? Yeah. The famous the famous bike in, in China falls over and the world changes, yeah. right? Well, first of all, the yeah. helicopter crash, it was yeah. reported as an accident by state television from Iran. Uh, yeah. Of course, ironic, right? Yeah. Probably not. But, but the, the thing is, like, how, how is does it, it influence us? Is it not important? Is it not event? Is my large model going to run white? Or does my large model need the data if I'm in Iran? Because there will be probably a holiday, right? Well, don't wishing anybody to crash in a helicopter, right? Yeah. But again, I'm in retail in Iran. I'm a business in Iran. There will be 10 days of mourning or something yeah. like this. I'm going to be shut down. What am I going to do for my cash? The, the cash model, the cash prediction model, CFOs like to have them under their desk yeah. as a very small model. Well, a lot, of, a lot of people want to get a win in the enterprise. So small right now is to get confidence. So if I'm the big boss, I want to show that I have, it's, I want to show that I have the AI moves. Right. Yeah. So I'll throw a little rag in there, I'll do a little mm -hmm. modeling. Yeah. But ultimately, it's a talent game as well. You need, you need the talent, you need the skills to Correct. execute. So I see, yeah. I see little wins to give confidence and budget, by the way, frankly. Yes, yes, so of course. budgets are now being allocated for yes. AI. And so you got to get some reps. There's no doubt, John, little wins are key. Like successes on the way is important for any CXO adopting any new technology that is not changing for AI. It's more important so than all the other technologies that you have the end game in mind, which is, in my view, and I'm can be wrong, <laughs> talk to me in a few years or a few <laughs> months, the large side is winning. Everybody who you hear saying do small stuff, like all the people say, oh, we're doing AI since 20 years. Well, kind of like machine learning or predictive analytics, nobody right. knew generative AI two years ago. Well, I've been, yep. I've, been, I've been saying do the small stuff. So we're debating that now. Perfect, okay, let's, let's debate go. it. <laughs> all right, so quick, no, we'll, we'll, we'll put that in. Another put, time, another time. We're gonna time. put a pin in that, but I do want to ask you two more questions. Yeah. Uh, IBM's prospects, but first before that, yep. um, um, we compare the internet and web to this AI movement and much different compressed scale, obviously, but transformative, you know, all aspects of it. The web is kind of like AI now, all the, everything changes. Question for you. Mm -hmm. And like the web, seeing consumer lead, consumer models are, are out there, open AI, yep. the, uh, the consumer providers like Amazon and Meta are buying all the chips. I talked to Broadcom and NVIDIA guys, they're saying this, the consumer AI is here first, yep. enterprise is lagging, uh, Dave calls it chatbot 2.0, not a, not a compelling, uh, enterprise AI well, direction. Will the AI um, gap between consumer and enterprise, which has traditionally been years no. in adoption matching, mm -hmm. compress, shrink, or is it shrinking and is it is it closer? Because there's data involved now, there's, mm -hmm. and there's actually connective tissue between consumerization of IT, which we've been talking about for over a decade, is actually happened. Right. So if consumerization of IT has happened, mm -hmm. You know, you'd think that the, cons the the lag between consumer AI and enterprise AI would be months, not years. What's your t what's your take on this? Well, definitely the lag is getting smaller, right? Because everything's moving faster, right? My research is enterprise acceleration. Yep. You have to move faster. You have to be agile. The interesting thing, though, is that there's something missing in the current generative AI to make it really work in the enterprise, right? Here's the example. How much of the consumer of my relevant data is in documents? Pretty much all of it pictures, videos, really documents, which generative AI, the transform algorithm can make sense of. Come to the enterprise, how much of the relevant data of an enterprise and documents versus transactional databases? It's all in transactional databases. Yeah. If you think about it as a consumer, well, I have some transactional database information too. It's always when you interact with an enterprise. It's your paycheck, yeah. the employment date, right? Yeah. It's, it's for government, right? Birthdays, tax yeah. things, and so yeah. on. You interact with an enterprise, then as a consumer, you have data, structured data. Structured data needs to be understood by Transformer 2.0 or it's going to be called whatever, then we'll see all hell break loose because right now you cannot make sense of what is happening in the enterprise for real. Once that happens, yeah. we'll see the next part and then we're not going to talk, oh, it's not relevant for the consumer for the first time the, the enterprise leads here because technology can do what the enterprise needs to do. So I think that is the interesting thing to look the people are researching algorithms and research development at universities at the startups. Yeah. That's the key price to look. That's a tipping point as well. That when that happens, when that transformation of database com gets converted to AI, because, then a whole new level correct. kicks in. Because we say it's all about the data. How oh, my data is in structured data, yeah, yeah. right? So, so in the, how can I get structured data into this? And you see the opposite right now, right? Every database under the sun is getting AI vector support. <laughs> that is to make the unstructured <laughs> data queryable in the structured world. Right? Let's bring it the yeah. other way around. We have to do get the transaction 
data out, the transactional way that you get it out is to put it in the lake house. There's no question about it. If you're a yeah. CXO listening, you have no lake house strategy. You're fumbling on your eye strategy. You're fumbling. No with small you're going to sink in the mud. Medium lotus or large or super large models. Olga, <laughs> that was an incredible amount of data you just transferred here on theCUBE. <laughs> putting it out there, out in the open. Final question for you as we yeah. wrap up here. By the way, what's the pop-up cube? We, we'll do whatever it takes to get the content. We're in Boston for IBM Think. IBM, they're yeah. back. IBM, ah. storied franchise, everyone knows it. They got a good comeback, then they kind of went, got lost a little bit, now they're back. Watson 1.0 is mm -hmm. not a winner. But Watson X is a winner. Yeah. It's looking good. They got Red Hat. Now they got right. HashiCorp. Yep. They got a Gen AI gift drops yes. in their lab. Gen AI is a gift to IBM, in my opinion, because yep. they have an install base. They have large scale. They got customers that have Correct. a lot of data yes. and probably aren't that mature on the quote lake house front. Your take on IBM and what they need to do as a company, if you had to look at IBM, their partners, their platforms, their opportunity. Uh, Arvin was on stage, the CEO saying, saying the pie is big for everyone. You know, never heard him say that before. He, Okay, can they pull a partner ecosystem together that's not a blue washing or just IBM blue? What's your take on IBM, their prospects, and what do they need yep. to do to, to be to get back into that, into the winner's circle? Right. So so first of all, congratulations for IBM to be back despite all the challenges, right? IBM is the only large old guard, as the friends at Amazon call them, IT vendor who had a uh, million plus revenue in the 90s and is still relevant today. They're the only one who also failed at building cloud. Oracle is the other one. They have not failed at building cloud. Uh, but their main butter and water is services. And uh, funny, you know Tony Bear, who's like on the call. Tony yeah. Bear did before it happened, then maybe did this on YouTube, a call like, what should IBM do? They should get rid of the technical services because they're not helping them on the margin side, right? They're not, not they're going to yeah. get commoditized. All the success correlations to Kindle right now. So I think that's the next step. And Arvin tends to decide, is IBM a software company or is IBM a service company with software, which they've been for a long time. And that has frankly hurt their products because if the product needed a little more services, that was an okay outcome for an IBM yeah. customer and for IBM. So the question is really how much software revenue can the new IBM produce? And then they have some interesting bets on the hardware side. Not to talk about the hardware refresh cycle, but this is the big year. This should last year would have been the year of quantum if there wouldn't have been this Gen AI thing, right? You yeah. saw the first time quantum to scale and the model which IBM is doing with the Eagle process is commoditization, this putting things in the rack, something well understood, something yeah. which can have lots of problems, but we could see the quantum breakthrough coming from this very company. And I'm not going to talk about this here, but that's something to keep tabs on because that was another key disruptive thing. We yeah. talk about Gen AI, we don't talk about quantum much. Yeah, quant quantum's yeah. right around the corner for sure. Yeah. All right, so you're saying that they should be a services company first and product second, or product first? No, no, first? I, I think Arvind, I mean, I'm a product guy. I love companies and product companies. Yeah, I do this too. This is why I, I, attracting the partners, are the partners plugins, or the partners who are making two, three, four times the revenue because they provide the services, and IBM is just providing the software license. That's going to be the key question for me. The HashiCorp acquisition points and the otherwise side, I'm not a big fan of the HashiCorp acquisition in general because we see that Generative AI is doing phenomenally on the IT ops, DevOps parts, right? Those scripts yeah. are 90, 95, 100% there because they're all in the public domain. I don't know if I had five minutes where I would say like, what were you thinking? Hashicorp. How can you get the multi multiples? Like HashiCorp is a great company, no question. Yeah. But it's a great asset, but it's an asset for someone who's trying to become a software company? I'm not sure. Who's someone who's trying to stabilize service revenue for another decade? I think IT ops, DevOps scripts are I gonna be the first to be commoditized. Yeah. It's definitely a service play. Yeah. It's a Red Hat. I mean, HashiCorp is a red is probably the closest thing to the original Red Hat. You give it away for free, and you service the enterprise. Yeah, but but Red Hat had so much. We see that today. All the code of Red Hat, forget the Linux, forget. But think of OpenShift. All that is not going to be touched by generative AI. Okay. In contrary, it's going to be a platform for generative AI across multi-cloud. Yeah. So it's a genius acquisition from that perspective. The HashiCorp code, which allows me to provision things in the cloud and moving things. In my view, that was yeah. a problem of HashiCorp yeah. and all the, the, the public sector, uh, the open source companies, right? They started for free and they can never find a way to charge appropriately for that. Yeah. So I don't see them for software, I see them for service and yeah. I don't know how much service pipeline HashiCorp will have. I think that brings, brings yeah. up a good point. We'll, we'll have to put another pin in that. The idea of agents coming mm -hmm. will solve a lot of those services inside the platforms. They're already there. They're already there. You're if starting if to see I it. write an IT ops DevOps script from scratch to move my data from Workday to Salesforce on Amazon, I mean, I'm stupid. Yeah, I'm stupid. I shouldn't do and that. You're I'm wasting on, my employer's you're money. You're bullish <laughs> on agents being relevant part of the future. A hundred percent. hundred percent. When we see this on the tiny things where of many yeah. co-pilots which I'm created, the assistance yeah. that Google Cloud showed us a few weeks ago. So there's no question. We need more help. We're running out of people, right? Finally, the yeah. Wall Street Journal talked about how the lack of more births 
in the first yeah. world is going to change dramatically our hand to machine ratio where we need any innovation that we need remember so, the discussion around oh we're going to get all the truck drivers obsolete yeah. right and then we had a backlog in long beach yeah. close to where i live of enough containers to be stacked from long beach to new york because there's not enough truck drivers please bring the self-driving truck to get my <laughs> delivery of my container <laughs> well, we need to rehaul the uh, highway system Holger, great to have you on the cube again. Great conversation because what's happening is ultimately we're living in a whole new world now where you're starting to see age and technology. The big get bigger, the rich get richer. Yep. And you know, what's the opportunity for entrepreneurs? I, I don't buy into this whole the big get bigger, the big get richer. If we on this podcast figure out a better yeah. algorithm for search than Google has. Yeah. Microsoft, Amazon would love to host us. Yes, yeah. I mean, Google, the, the founders, right? Larry Page and Brin had a great idea, but it took them years to even build the infrastructure to index the internet. Today, we can index the internet yeah. with a new algorithm yeah. any given time. So I think the barriers of entry are lower. We see that with, with the new AI startups, right? You have a European one with, with Alex Alpha, you have a French one, or a German one, you have a French one. I don't know how long they're going to be around, but the barriers of entry, everybody likes to have loads, and yeah. we have this infinite compute system which enables startups a yeah. great and bright idea to do something. Well, I think we're both in agreement, but also might debate some of the, the key points around big and small. But the one thing that is certain is that there's a platform shift happening. A, a, a combination of models are going to be interacting and intersecting, yes. sharing data through APIs, sharing data through common platforms. Maybe they look like label blocks, but ultimately big systems will work on big processing things. Data will be the key. Yep. The Cube is bringing the data. Hopefully, thanks for coming back on the thanks Cube. Thanks for having me. We're at IBM Think. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. Dave Vellante is at Dell Tech World. We have everyone all over the world. This week and next week is conference season, bringing all the action. We're on the Cube. We'll be right back. Stay with us for more coverage from Boston.